to uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering's New Year's reception and lecture, just in case you are in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, would, of course, have had this in our new building if it were ready. Uh, it's not. It's next door, numbers three and four, Carlton House Terrace. And it was a great achievement uh, to move into that building. And I want to thank you, all of you for contributions to that. Uh, and contributions to what the Academy has done over 2007. And right at the end of the evening, I want to thank you for all the things that we have asked you to do in 2008 and beyond, some which is quite practical. Uh, in 2007, we did move to numbers three and four Carlton House Terrace. That will be our home. It will be, I believe, a global home for global engineering, a place where people around the world can come uh, and discuss, debate, and have meetings about engineering, not just the UK. Uh, we received a, a very reasonable settlement from the government. Uh, I never think anything is reasonable enough, but it was reasonable. Uh, and indeed, we strengthened, most importantly, our links to the engineering institutions of the United Kingdom. This, I believe, is very, very important indeed, to find activities we can do together where we will be much greater acting as one rather than acting as 34 different bodies. And I think we're finding that, that that is the uh, purpose of engineering, which is to move engineering much more to the centre of society, to remind people that it is a fundamental of society, it looks both ways, to science and to business, to society as a whole. And it's there to solve the great issues and challenges of the day. And not only solve those, but also to design the future. And that is what engineers do. And that is what the institutions with the academy intends to make sure that everyone recognizes. That we design the future, which means that we can uh, play our part in actually solving in a practical way the mitigation uh, 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 climate change, new sources of energy, poverty reduction, and improve the well-being of the, uh, the human race generally. Tonight I've got two particular functions to perform. The first is to present the President's Medal. Uh, the, the medal is awarded to an individual or to an organisation uh, that's contributed significantly to the Academy's aims and work through initiative in promoting excellence in engineering. This year, for the very first time, the President's Medal is being awarded to an organisation, Rolls-Royce. Now, Rolls-Royce uh, has been a household name, synonymous with quality in engineering for over a century. It's remarkable, though, how reputations are tough to change. And I'm sure that some people in the world as a whole think that Rolls Royce still make motor cars. But the company is, of course, the UK's leading engineering company, providing power systems and services worldwide for civil and defence aerospace and for the marine and energy markets. Its success as a turbine maker is extraordinary. Rolls Royce sustains this by investing in the future. And that's not only on research and development, which it spent an enormous amount, but it invests in people too, uh, in various things such as the Science Prize, which works through schools to inspire and attract young people into engineering and science. I've had the privilege, personally, to know several people in Rolls Royce, including uh, two chief executives. And all I can say is that the investment in people and makes it for extraordinary rewards. Some very great people in Rolls Royce. The company's been an enormous and serious uh, supporter of the Academy over many years. It's a sponsor of our publication, Engineer, uh, our, and it's a sponsor of our awards dinner. And we co-funded two research chairs at Manchester and Sheffield Universities. Rolls Royce also boasts more fellows of this Academy than any other engineering company. 35 of our fellows are in some way connected to Rolls-Royce, and we are grateful for their generous contributions of 
their time and expertise. The business of engineering is about designing the future. Rolls Royce is synonymous with technological progress and engineering excellence. The company is an inspiration to the engineering community and richly deserves the President's Medal, which I'd now like to present. So can I ask John Rose, Chief Executive, to come on stage to, to receive the medal? And John, we're going to do it over there. <laughs> <laughs> essentially um, as a result of team sport. Um, the second thing that I think it recognizes is, in a sense, the longevity of the business and its programs. And many of the people who have been involved in where we are today um, are in this room tonight. And more than almost any company, it's decisions that were made in the past um, that allow you to be where you are today. Um, just to give you an illustration of the longevity, and many of you will understand this anyway, we're still developing and selling new the Avon engine, which was developed in the late 40s, even before Sir Ralph joined the company. <laughs> and, and we will sell it as a new product for another decade or 20 years, and then having supported it for another 20 or 30 years or so, it's now gone from being an air engine to an engine that pumps gas pipelines mm -hmm. on gas pipelines. Um, that program will have a 100 year life. That's quite extraordinary. And as such, I think that any recognition of Rolls Royce is fundamentally a recognition of uh, the people who've made these decisions and participated in them, and the fact that this is a team sport. So thank you very much for very well. Tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Butler, uh, the Bishop of Southwark. Uh, Bishop Butler uh, holds degrees in e electronics at three uh, and has lectured in the subject at the University of Zambia and the University of Kent. Uh, he is a lapsed uh, child engineer uh, who's also a bishop and uh, not that the right way around. Uh, Bishop uh, Butler has sat in the House of Lords since uh, 1996 and he's a regular contributor uh, to Radio 4's Thought for the Day program. So uh, Bishop Butler is going to talk to us and it's over to you. wondering what uh, qualifications a bishop has for sharing any thoughts on the engineering profession. And the answer is I must admit very little. 
but I'm conscious that there's a, a certain overlap of engineering experience uh, in the hall this evening with those who are the most knowledgeable and indeed eminent in the profession, accompanied by those for whom engineering uh, has not been their uh, consuming passion or professional occupation. In that sense, I, I may have a basic qualification because throughout my own professional life, engineering and church ministry have interwoven. This is uh, reflected in my title for the lecture, which comes from a phrase which I often use. To sin is human, to forgive divine, to check is engineering. <laughs> the overlap of discipline started with me uh, at an early age. I went to the kind of grammar school where there was a daily religious assembly which some of the masters took in turn to present. Once a month, for the seven years that I was a pupil, the elderly physics master, who had a low opinion of schoolboys, used exactly the same biblical reading every month. Looking over his bushy eyebrows at us, he growled, reading from the book of Proverbs, Go to the ants, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. <laughs> so when I reached his tender care as a sixth former, I was very well prepared for the fact that studying physics might not be too comfortable with him. It wasn't. He had two favourite phrases. I am the only visual aid in this classroom. <laughs> and speaking to me after some misdemeanour, some people might blame your parents, some people might blame your genes, some people might blame your school, but I, Butler, I just blame you. <laughs> I still quake at the memory of the experiments we conducted one hot Friday afternoon. It was tedious, we were measuring and plotting on a graph the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Now we all knew what the answer must be. And so I was rather amused when my graph was indicating a different answer, with point after point appearing in the wrong place. Well, the hour was late, and I wanted to get home, so I massaged the figures a little to give them their correct position. I was interrupted by a growl behind me. My teacher's hand shot out, and he pulled open the drawer under the bench. Inside was a large permanent magnet. <laughs> Butler, he said, never do that again. A scientist records what he sees and measures, not what he thinks he should see. A truth which is absolutely basic in science and engineering, but also has a wider validity in other aspects of human life, and I'm glad that I learned it at an early age, if painfully. I was reminded, reminded of that incident some years later when I heard Professor Eric Lathwaite, who some of you might remember helped to develop the linear electric motor. He said, to see measurement after measurement in a well-conducted experiment clicking into their predicted place is a deeply awesome experience. And so it is. And if I would want to point to only one experience which is common to science, engineering and theology. It is that feeling of awe when you're probing new insights. <laughs> Let's call it the wow factor. But to return to my school days, an additional physics master showed up in my final year. He was straight from university, hardly older than his pupils, but he was full of enthusiasm for state-of-the-art physics and introduced us to atomic physics, cosmology and the rest. Mr. President, we know there's no substitute for the good, keen and enthusiastic teacher if new generations are to be attracted to any subject, and particularly to engineering. It was through his influence that I decided that electronic engineering best suited my own interests, and I was fortunate to gain a place at Leeds University. It was a pretty traditional engineering programme. General engineering in the first year, mechanical, civil and electrical in the second, and then we, uh, we specialised in the third year, in my case, in electronics. Now I struggled a little with the earlier set of disciplines because they weren't my direct interest, 
Now, in later life, I was glad that I'd learned at least the basics of them. But with electronics in the third year, academic life began to prosper. <clears throat> but I hope you'll forgive me if I say, in my experience, God has an unsettling sense of humour. Just when I was at my most motivated and immersed in my electronic studies, I literally bumped into a friend from school days. And to my surprise, I learned that he was uh, training for ordination in Leeds. He invited me for supper at his hostel, and I agreed to go. We had a service of even some before supper told me, would you like to come to that as well? I was an unenthusiastic, occasional churchgoer, but I agreed out of politeness. I went, and the wow factor hit me. It was threefold. The wow of worship, where he felt that the awesome God was as close as a heartbeat away. Then the wow of a supportive community life. And thirdly, the wow of animated conversation over supper. The hostel was run by the community of the resurrection, the Murfield Fathers, active both in the slums of British cities and in Africa, particularly in South Africa. Trevor Huddleston was one member. Desmond Tutu was amongst the ordinance they were trained. Worship, theology and social justice were knitted together. It was riveting stuff. And truth to tell, I never really went home again. The call to ordination had gripped me. So I finished my undergraduate studies and was ready to go for ordination training. But rather surprisingly, I got a good degree and was offered research studies in electronics. Do it, advised my future theological college principal. It might come in useful later. I did, and it has. The research for a master's degree consisted of the design and construction of a rather clever piece of active electronic circuitry. My supervisor had made the mathematical predictions of how it should behave. I proved that the predictions were correct experimentally. And I went off for ordination training with the satisfaction that engineering had been good to me, but I was now leaving it behind. That was not quite the way it worked out. But let me pause and slightly retread some steps, because for me the placements in industry during long vacations proved to be important learning experiences, if not always positive ones. Straight after school, to earn a little money, I worked in the accounts department of Mitchells and Butler's Brewery in Birmingham. Every morning, each junior clerk, such as myself, was given several dozen orders from pubs for various purchases, and it was our job to produce the relevant set of invoices. It wasn't totally straightforward because the price of the merchandise depended upon whether it was a tied or a freed pub. Nevertheless, it was hardly brain science, and being quite good at mental arithmetic, after I'd been there a couple of weeks, I was completing my ration of invoices by about 11.30 in the morning. And then I spent the rest of the day reading my new textbooks. This proved to be a mistake. One early afternoon, a senior manager walked in through the office, saw me reading, and told the supervisor, get rid of that idle boy, he's doing nothing. And so I was sacked from my first job. My supervisor was a little apologetic, as he wished me well. He said, I should have told you that in working life it's very important to make sure that your work fits the time available for it. And if it doesn't, slow down until it does. <laughs> Perhaps that was the general working culture of the late 50s. I know it's not so today. During the following years long vacation, I learned another lesson from working life. I was now with Phillips Electrical at Croydon, gaining engineering work experience. I was placed on the production line, making decks for record players. The line consisted of a dozen or more workers, each contributing to a particular task, and I had the penultimate position. It was my job to take the record player out of its cardboard box and test whether the motor was working. If it was, all well and good. If it wasn't, I was to undo a couple of screws, push in a couple of copper strips, hit the motor with a wooden mallet, take out the strips, tighten up the screws, and test it again. If it worked, it returned to the production line. If it didn't, it was rejected. 
it was a task within my competence, and I was happy enough doing it. It was the next stage which got me into trouble. Having tested the record deck, I was supposed to put the deck back into its cardboard box, which then travelled to the last man on the line, who took the deck out of the box and put it into its cabinet, a simple enough task which set me thinking. The foreman had greeted me at the beginning of the first morning with a well-rehearsed pet speech. We like having engineering students, he said. I'm sure you'll learn a lot from us, and we might even learn something from you. So don't be shy to share any ideas you might have. Foolishly, I took him at his word. <laughs> and during the lunch break, I went to his office. Look, I said, having taken the deck out of the box and tested it, it will be no more trouble for me to put it straight into its cabinet, and it will <coughs> save a job. He shut the office door. Have you spoken to anybody about this thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I replied. Good, he said. He picked up the phone, the phone and spoke. Jim, he said, we've got a smart-ass student here causing trouble. Can you have him in research? So by the first afternoon, rather than news, I was in research, the quickest promotion I'd ever had. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the summer working happily on a prototype stereo record player using the music from the Overture to the Merry Wives of Windsor, which was the only stereo record we had. Now, were I going to share the experience with my lecturer back at the university, he said, well, of course, the whole factory would be unionised, each job would be negotiated. Your suggestion, if it got out, might have shut down the production line for days. <laughs> Nobody would have believed it was an idea from the top of your head. They would have discerned a deep management plot and of course he was right. But at the time, the message I clearly picked up from that work experience was, in engineering production, ideas are not welcome. If you're an ideas man, go in the direction of research. So at much the same time, from the Murfield Fathers, I was picking up the vision of a needy world with great projects to tackle where all were needed, whereas at Physics Electrical, I was picking up the signals you're a bit of a nuisance getting in the way of our machine. It was really no contest. I learned a different lesson during my third work placement a year later, which was just before my final year, and I was working uh, for English Electric at their Nelson Laboratories near Stafford. And they were developing the Juice computer, a huge valve-driven digital computer. It was a frustrating task because it was a hot summer and the air conditioning was in its infancy, at least there. The hundreds of valves heating up meant it was very difficult to get thermal stability, which meant that the computer was constantly malfunctioning. If the windows were open to get a breeze, in would fly moths from the neighbouring can of chase and get themselves splattered in the punch card readers, shutting them down and everything came to a halt. I realised that the gap between an idea which might work in the research laboratory was something else when you tried to actually develop it and became an even bigger challenge when you tried to put it into production. A reason, no doubt, why in Britain we do often come up with excellent ideas, but some of the best are then developed elsewhere. Now, I share these experiences with you because I want later to refer to the second objective in your strategic plan. This is, to quote you, to attract more people to a wider range of engineering careers. You flag up, quite rightly, the need to engage with students and schools and develop and sustain students' interests in the subject. And from my own experience, I quite agree. But this should include those who are responsible for new engineering graduates in their first jobs. If we want good young engineers, then we must nurture and value them when they come our way, for otherwise they won't stay. Mr. President, I'm aware that your own group, and indeed Rolls-Royce, the nice recipient of your medal, are models in collaborating with schools and universities and have a, an enviable programme of nurturing engineering graduates. Looking to the future, I'm hoping that in hard times, if they come our way, there will be no cutbacks in, the, in this seed-born work. 
and that other companies will themselves adopt your example of best practice. But to return to my overlapping lines, after saying goodbye to engineering, I trained for ministry and was ordained a priest in the Church of England and worked in parishes in Wisbech and the Fens and in Folkestone. Meanwhile, unknown to me, a new university was being created in Zambia in Central Africa. The Vice Chancellor wanted to go forward into a new era from the days when most of the education in the country had been provided by Christian schools and colleges. So his new university was to be thoroughly secular with not even a chapel. The Archbishop of Central Africa wasn't happy with this and had the idea of looking for a priest who was qualified to teach at the university as a way of at least getting a church presence there. He worked through the Church of England's directory and soon, soon came to the B's. But I was the right age, had a higher degree, he's the man. So a letter came out of the blue asking me whether I'd like to apply for the post of lecturer in electrical engineering at the University of Zambia. My wife and I hadn't been married long, we had a new baby, but we thought, why not? It will be an adventure. And after all, Africa had been, had been on our radar screen since my time at Murphy. And so it started six glorious years, not only helping to start a new school of engineering, but literally helping to physically build it, and teaching year after year the elite of Zambian school leaders, because law and engineering were the two subjects that the government was giving priority to in building a new nation. I was also fully involved with my priestly ministry on campus and in the townships and at the cathedral and in the wider diocese. And sometimes the worlds overlapped. During the vacation, I used to pack my toolkit, multimeter, and some basic components, and my wife and I would visit remote rural mission stations where I would attempt to mend malfunctioning electrical equipment. During one visit, our baby, Nicholas, developed a sore throat. We took him to the sister who ran a small clinic there, and she diagnosed tonsillitis. She gave him medicine, and we were leaving when a local woman brought in her baby, and we stopped to talk. The child was roughly the same age as Nicholas, had the same symptoms. The sister came up with the same diagnosis, and dispensed the same medicine. Some three days later, Nicholas was very much better, and we returned to the clinic for a checkup. The sister was pleased with his progress. I asked how the African child was doing. Oh, she said, I'm sorry to tell you, he's died. Died? Can't have died. He was the same age, he had the same disease, you gave him the same medicine. How can it be that Nicholas is better than he's died? Haven't you heard of malnutrition, she said. Your child is basically healthy, and so when he catches a disease with proper treatment, he'll soon throw it off. But most of the children around here are suffering from malnutrition, and it seriously weakens them. They have no basic strength to resist disease. So when they get ill, they often go downhill and very quickly. But of course we did know about malnutrition, but to know something with your head and to have a dead child clawing at your heart is rather different. And so with some of our students we were caught up into that battle against malnutrition, campaigning for better nutrition, establishing stores in the townships where cheap nutritious food could be bought, buying in tons of dry fish from the lakes hundreds of miles to the north, organising student work parties to put them into manageable packs, arguing with civil servants, for import permits for high protein milk biscuits from Australia to be dispensed in township schools. As you know, because I know through your projects you're engaged in Africa, the task of practical care is wearing and it's endless, but it's what changes lives. Then my basic knowledge of civil engineering from my early Leeds undergraduate days became useful as we joined in projects for building better houses for the shantytown dwellers. The government put down roads, water and sewerage, and then we, then we helped them draw up two or three plans for simple housing, which the people were to build themselves using soil cement bricks. And my students spent Saturday afternoons 
helping to advise them. A great joy of the university was the international group of academics who were my colleagues. Zambia was non aligned in those days, and so we had lecturers and technicians of all nationalities and benefited from their particular insights and cultures. For example, the can do attitude of our American Dean of Engineering has left an indelible impression on me. Whilst the political skills of our Russian colleagues trying to survive in the darkest days of the Cold War were something again. One member of the Soviet Union team spotted that I noticed him slipping some transistors into his lab coat pockets. He came across and whispered, these are for Lithuania, Mr. Butler, not Russia. <laughs> Two Russian technicians came to install and test an electronic microscope, a, a gift from the Soviet Union. I went three times to its official opening. Each time it didn't quite work. When I asked another Russian colleague what was wrong, he said, nothing's wrong, but once it works, their job will be done and they'll have to go home. <laughs> it never did work in my security. It was a good time in other ways to be in Zambia. The copper mining industry was at its most buoyant and so the professional world was wide open for our graduates and part of my responsibilities was to visit the mines, arranging work experience and graduate apprenticeships for them. Then on the campus itself, although we were a new university, carved out of the bush, and as well as having great shortages of quite basic equipment, we also had some surprising state-of-the-art equipment. For example, I still don't know where it came from, but we were given a commercial IBM 1130 computer together with an air-conditioned lab to house it. It was far more powerful than my earlier JUICE computer, and being transistor-based, it was stable and reliable. It worked. Not surprisingly, not too many people there knew how to use it. So whereas back at the Leeds University, in my research days there, I had to book the use of the computer in 10-minute slots, in Zambia, I had virtually the sole use a much more powerful computer for days on end. We used it to good effect in our work of nation building. For example, in Zambia, electric power was generated at the Kariba Hydroelectric Dam in the far south of the country. The copper mines, which needed the power, were 2,000 miles away in the north, and so huge electric power transmission lines marched across the bush. There were seasonal problems with those power lines. At any time of the year, the booms climbing them would make a mess of themselves and of the electricity supply. In the dry season, bush fires would reduce the insulation between the cables. And then in the rainy season, massive tropical storms generating multiple lightning strikes could cause havoc to the power lines. Not only direct hits were a problem, but near misses would generate travelling power surges which would be driven up the lines in both directions, being reflected at the end and then meeting once more and either amplifying or modifying the surge, and in the former case, breaking down insulation after insulation. The lines could be protected by providing a further cable carrying no power above the others. This, like a lightning conductor, would shield them from the worst effects. But the provision of that extra cable was an expensive business. We used our computer to predict the effect of lightning strikes on different places on the power lines, trying to discern which places were most sensitive, and then advising where it would be most cost effective to put the additional protection. Quite useful, really. Then my own professor of electrical engineering, a ferociously bright electric power man from Liverpool University, suggested we combine our skills to do some serious research. He knew about gas blast circuit breakers, I knew about computers. Together we worked up a project in collaboration with Railroad Electrical, Leeds University and the local power company using our immense computer availability to provide computer simulations of the behaviour of newly designed circuit breakers. After several years, I took study leave at Leeds University with literally a trunk full of computer printouts, and I wrote it up and gained 
a PhD. Then he was back to Britain for a seven year spell at the University of Kent at Canterbury in a similar field of work. But this time I was employed as senior university chaplain, but it was also attached to the electronics department for some teaching and research. A piece of work there caught up with me in an intriguing way in later life. A group in the electronics department were working with radical electronics on a specialised FM radio. I was recruited to the team to do some of the computer simulation to determine the necessary tolerances to be used on the various components. I was a little puzzled to learn that the physical size of the radio was a vital specification. And pressing a little further, I discovered that the radios were destined for Iraq. This was the mid-70s, when Saddam Hussein was being supported by the West in Iraq's war with Iraq. It seemed that the Russians had supplied Iraq with uh, lots of new tanks, but their radios weren't up to scratch, and Iraq had commissioned Rekord to provide new radios which physically had to fit exactly into the slot located by the rejected Russian ones. That wasn't difficult. Well, the task was finished, and I went on to other research, until some 20 years later, as Bishop of Leicester, I was giving medals after the first Gulf War against Iraq to some soldiers at an intelligence and communications base in Leicestershire. Bishops sometimes do that kind of thing. Later, a young captain showed me some of the equipment which they'd captured in the war. <laughs> and to my shock, it included the radio I worked on. I said, uh, I've got a confession to make. I have developed that radio. Don't worry, Bishop, he replied. We know. And we've got a copy of your circuit diagram. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only time during my 22 years as a bishop in Wilson and then Leicester and now Southwark that my engineering work has so directly impacted upon my ministry. But wherever I've been bishop, I've been fortunate in being able to make good contacts <coughs> with the local university and have tried to show an intelligent interest in the way that engineering is developing in the UK. And before sharing uh, some of my anxieties, I thought that it might be helpful to share my former experience with you so that you know at least where I'm coming from in my overlapping worlds and professions. I have a notice above my desk, which for me goes to the heart of the other. And it's a sentence from a postcard sent in the mid-19th century from one scientist, Maxwell, to another, Jewell, after Jewell had made a breakthrough in his research. And Maxwell wrote this thing. There are very few people who have stood where you stand, and after a period of minute observation and patient mental toil, have put their minds into exact accordance with things as they really are. To put your minds into exact accordance with things as they really are. That surely is the aim of science and it's the starting point of the rigour of engineering. For without putting our minds into exact accordance with things as they really are, we're not in a position to find the ways of making those things work creatively and productively for us. And Maxwell's words are a constant reminder to me that it's the role of theology to attempt the impossible task of trying to put our minds and hearts and souls in exact accordance with things as they ultimately are. People used to be optimistic that science would eventually be able to explain everything. But things as they really are have turned out to be more wonder-filled and mysterious than might have been thought. We shouldn't be surprised at this, for you'll remember that when the great scientist Isaac Newton was near death, after a lifetime of scientific experimentation and with a host of new theories and laws behind him, he said, I still feel that I'm like a child on a beach, turning over a few pebbles, when all around is an infinite ocean to be explored. I feel like this when I read about what physicists now understand about the structure of the atom. When I was learning my sixth form physics, it was relatively easy. The atom we were taught was a kind of microscopic universe solar system with a core of protons and neutrons and 
circulating electrons, adding little mass, but balancing out the electric charge. It hasn't turned out to be quite as simple as that. Today we hear of quarks and muons and taons and mesons and gluons and gravitons. We hear of elementary particles and antiparticles. Now we don't have to only worry about mass and charge, we have to consider, in addition, spin and quantum numbers. And whereas it was difficult enough to understand what was going on when we regarded those elementary particles as points or fields, now they're thought to be different vibration or excitation of strings of energy inhabiting perhaps five, six, seven or even eight dimensions. <coughs> it used to be thought that if we knew where every particle was and what it was doing, then we could predict everything about today and tomorrow. And in fact, I think the person in the street still thinks this, because the person in the street is usually a few decades behind scientific thought. But that's all nonsense. Einstein's discoveries early in the 20th century and the insights of quantum uh, mechanics have led us to understand that matter is at heart uncertain. If you know where a particle is, you don't know exactly what it's doing, and vice versa. And that, of course, is at the level of infinitely small elementary particles. But even at a global level, things are more complicated than they seem. The catastrophe theory is teaching us that energy is often so finely balanced that a small haphazard movement can have catastrophic effects. I heard a weather forecaster say that when analysing storms in Britain, it's sometimes possible to trace the disturbance in the atmosphere back and back until it originates in a falling tree in the West Indies. We can calculate the eclipse of the sun to the accuracy of a nanosecond, but even an hour before, we can't predict with certainty whether the eclipse might be obscured by a cloud when we try to observe it in Britain. And that's just day by day weather. It's not surprising that the predictions concerning global warming and climate change are today exercising some of the best brains on Earth, and rightly so. To put our minds in exact accordance with things as they really are, but things as they really are, at the cosmic level, are wonderful. But things as they really are, at the cosmic level, are wonderful. I've been listening for a forthcoming broadcast with what is called the Goldilocks Enigma. Why is the universe just right for life to emerge? Not too hot, not too cold, here on Earth, but just right. And why are the cosmic laws of nature and the fundamental constants just right for anything to exist at all. Changing any of them, even minutely, would make the universe sterile or non-existent. And why is the measured value of dark matter in the universe 120 powers of 10 less than its calculated value, which, were it to be different, would have lethal consequences? Summing up the cosmic wow factor, and quoting Wendy Friedman, writing in The New Physics, she writes, The measurements point to a universe filled with a kind of matter which we've never seen, propelled by a force which we don't understand. I'm not asking you to live on my overlap, but you'll realise that when questions such as those are botting around in my head, I'm not sure whether I'm thinking science, engineering or theology. The report in The Guardian last week of Hubble Telescope's first picture of galactic rings stated that it was further evidence, not only of Einstein's theory of gravitation, but of the existence of dark matter, which couldn't be observed directly, but could be discerned by its influence on everything else. Let me say that again. Couldn't be observed directly, but could be discerned by its influence on everything else. And that has echoes for me in the language of Christian mystics, who for centuries have been saying precisely the same thing concerning the hiddenness of God's awesome reality, which can't be observed directly, for it's too massively real for human understanding, but it can be discerned by its influence on everything else. I recently conducted a clergy study day with the title God, Pure and Applied where I tried to tease out further some of the other images on the overlap between science, 
engineering religion, which intrigued me. Let me share just one more with you. Many of you will, I hope, remember with affection the old green screen Amstrad word processor, the first one available uh, to people like myself. And my software included a chess program. And I typed in my move, and then the screen went blank for a few seconds, whilst the computer thought, and then the computer displayed its move. Now the program had five levels of difficulty, and as I started at the bottom level, after a while I began to win quite frequently. The computer stepped up to the next level of difficulty. This was indicated by the fact that the screen went blank for a longer period of time between moves. The computer was taking more time to analyse and plan, but when it did make its move, it invariably won the game. And so on through the levels, with the screen blank at the top level for several minutes at a time. Now a casual observer coming in the room would have said, why are you looking at a blank screen? <laughs> Nothing's going on, something's gone wrong. But the reverse was true. A great deal was going on behind that blank screen, and nothing was wrong. On the contrary, the darkness was an indication that I was developing more skill in my chess play. And so it is for us, I'd argue, when we're wrestling with the most fundamental questions in science, engineering or theology, courageously staying with a darkness we don't understand and find difficult to penetrate is sometimes the precursor to fresh insights. The wow experience doesn't always come easily or cheaply. Well, Mr. President, you'll be pleased to know that now I want to develop my main thesis for the evening. This is that we need more young people to follow engineering as a profession. First, because the wow factor in engineering, to put our minds into exact accordance with things as they really are, and then develop them and make them work for the good of humanity, is a deeply satisfying way of spending the one life we've been given. And I want more young people to discover it. Then my thesis is that secondly, we need more young people as engineers because the world is fragile and might not survive. And engineering solutions have their part to play in this race for survival. In 1969, I was sitting on my veranda on the edge of the Zambian bush looking at the vastness of the tropical night sky. Then on my television screen, pictures came through from the first men on the moon. And I saw that iconic image of the Earth, a tiny ball of colour floating through the vastness of dark space, unique, fragile, vulnerable. And nothing that has happened since then has reduced the vulnerability. On the contrary, I agree with Sir David King, the government's former chief scientific advisor, that global warming and climate change are probably the biggest challenge that our civilization has faced. We can't take the Goldilocks condition for granted for too much longer. And this is a matter for clear thinking, careful planning, and hard science and technology. There are plenty of activists who will come up with idealistic solutions or unrealistic and untested proposals. And our parliamentary system is vulnerable to such approaches. I'm now going to make myself very unpopular but I noticed that whereas in China every member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo was an engineer by training, in the UK the background of government and shadow ministers in the Commons is predominantly law, economics, local politics and the media. I can't spot one with an engineering background and very few with a background in science of any sort. Now, can't, the same can't be said, of course, for the laws, where the lead minister on climate change, Lord Rooker, is a former engineer who does pay his subscriptions, uh, and uh, several eminent members of the House of Lords are members uh, of this uh, academy. And by coincidence, I have uh, been in the Lords this afternoon 
where the latest bill on climate change is being debated and where those engineers are playing a full part. It's not always appreciated just how detailed is the scrutiny which the Lords give to such a bill as is necessary because in our political culture, whatever party is in power, there's always the danger that short-term political considerations driven by public opinion will take precedence over the hard-headed, long-term strategic plans which sometimes are needed, not least in a subject such as global warming. I'm not saying that our political culture is hostile to engineering, it's just that it's mostly ignorant of it. And given that, it's not surprising if engineering decisions are taken in fits and starts, as with the recent announcement of the U-turn concerning the building of new nuclear power stations, which I agree with. And that ignorance of engineering at Westminster simply reflects the situation in the popular culture, as one of your recent surveys shows. Engineering, sadly, doesn't have a lot of place in public consciousness. An engineer in the public mind is the mechanic who comes to mend my washing machine when my wife has said quite rightly, don't touch it, you'll make it worse. <laughs> That's a vital contribution to the common good. But the public don't mostly associate the term engineer with the kind of eminent chartered engineers gathered in this room this evening. Indeed, the public have very little knowledge of the work of the professional engineer and the media rarely helped them to gain that knowledge. And in spite of all the efforts of the professional <coughs> institutions over the last decades, I'm sad to say that the battle for the engineering hearts and minds of new generations is being lost. Let's look at the latest figures from the report of Engineering UK. Over the next decade, the number of 18 to 22 year olds will decline by one in six in total. There will be fewer of them around. The pass rate of mathematics GCSE students with a grade A to C, a real requisite for a realistic career in engineering, is 55%. Whereas the number of engineering undergraduates has remained stable over the past six years at just over 100,000, the proportion of engineering undergraduates and postgraduate students has declined from 9% to 6% in the same period. And meanwhile, the number of engineering learners in further education in England has fallen by a quarter. And one third of engineering apprenticeships aren't completed. And to add to the bad news, the proportion of female engineering apprentices is a low 3%. We're even doing better with that in the church with women priests. <laughs> and almost we're vicious. It's interesting to note that the Irish government are making very determined efforts to correct the gender imbalance in engineering in Irish colleges and universities, but I don't see the same signs here. But let me go on. More than half of the postgraduate engineering students come from outside the EU. And that would be fine were it not for the fact that the number of electronic and electrical engineering postgraduates from the UK has fallen sharply over the last five years and now approaches half their previous number. Then the total number of registered engineers has fallen by 8% over the last decade and over a quarter of chartered engineers are aged over 65 while the mean age is 55. And to add insult to injury, the unemployment rate of engineering graduates after six months at the last count is one of the highest in any subject category at around 8%. And that's a mighty strange figure. For a recent survey of over 400 engineering companies revealed that they're already finding it difficult to recruit graduate engineers and anticipating more skill shortages in future years. Well, that's the bad news, and there's more where that came from. But the news isn't all done. The government has made it clear that, to quote, a strong supply of scientists, engineers and technologists will be essential if the UK is to have sustainability of the research base, giving UK business and public service the drive and capability to innovate. Improved investment in research and development is promised by the Treasury to go together with the aim of a doubling 
in the total number of apprenticeships by 2020. Well, that's all very well, but how are those aspirations to be delivered in a world where three quarters of 16 to 19 year olds say they know nothing or not much of the work of engineers? One third, as I've said, of engineering apprenticeships are completed, and the latest figures, as I've indicated, suggest that you're more likely to be, un to be unemployed if you graduate in engineering than in virtually any other subject. Mr. President, that's why I believe that your second objective in your strategic plan 2005 to 2010 to attract more people to a wider range of engineering careers is vital. We need them because the engineering profession is stretching and fulfilling in human potential. And we need them because there are problems to be solved and plans to be made and work to be done if the challenge of global warming and the future of the human race is to be tackled effectively. And here I believe the problem can be part of the solution. I'm in and out of both primary and secondary schools quite a lot. And the one issue that's motivating young people today is that of global warming and climate change. It's becoming embedded in the curriculum and it's appearing in out-of-school activities. And here we have an issue which not only engineering can well address, but it won't be solved without a plethora of engineering initiatives. Indeed, Sir David King has been even more forthright, saying that any approach to climate change that doesn't focus on technological solutions is one of utter hopelessness. I hope that your Academy's best program for curriculum enrichment in science and engineering is taking this on board. The question of energy production is full of engineering challenges, whether we're talking about wind, wave, tidal, solar panels, or conventional hydroelectric schemes, or more efficient gas or coal generation, or a new generation of nuclear fission power stations or even nuclear fusion power stations, or even the engineering problems of dealing with nuclear waste, or even the hope of energy from nuclear fission, which always seems to be 20 years in the future. Then there's the challenge of new forms of transport, electric plug-and-go vehicles, hybrid vehicles, microlight popular cars using the technology of Formula One design, car-powered fuel cells. All of this without the challenges of agricultural engineering and initiatives in countries with different climates to our own. In Africa, efficient charcoal stoves, boilers that run on sugarcane waste, rugged cheap laptop computers recharged by inbuilt solar cells, wind up radios and computers, solar cells charging the batteries of remote and inaccessible uh, radio beacons. The list is endless. And the ideas for engineering school projects are innumerable. But when I try to find them on the web, I'm disappointed. I might be unlucky, but when I log into climatechangeeducation.org, which seems to be one of the better home pages, I can download related school lesson plans on geography, health and medicine, education, earth science, social science, life science, maths, history, current affairs, religion and ethics nothing on engineering. Now it may be that engineering doesn't show up on the curriculum directly, so the kind of engineering lesson plans that we need have to be described as something else to get a look in. But I hope that somebody is giving attention to this, for this is a moment in history when children are interested in the very issue where engineering has things to say and things to discover and do and we shouldn't miss the moment. There's a story told of the heating engineer who made an emergency call at a factory where the boiler had broken down with dire consequences. He was there 10 minutes, he carefully examined the boiler, he then leant down, tapped a component with his hammer, and the boiler sprang back to life. The plant manager was much relieved and was quite willing to pay the invoice when it arrived, but he was puzzled by the sum for it was for £100 and 10p. He wrote asking for a breakdown of the cost. It came back. 
for tapping with the hammer, 10p, for knowing where to tap, £100. <laughs> Mr President, at this moment, global warming and the challenge of climate change is where we tap if we want young engineers. And that also means that we must appeal to their altruistic aspirations rather than merely emphasising the personal rewards. There's a story I often tell of two young men who foolishly left an Indian village late in the day on their way to a neighbouring town, even though they'd been warned that there was a man-eating tiger in the district. After a while, they heard a low growl. One of the young men stopped, took off his rucksack and put on a pair of running shoes. I don't know why you're doing that, his companion said. You'll never outrun a tiger. I don't have to outrun the tiger, came the reply. I only have to outrun you. <laughs> well, of course, we live in a competitive nation and world. But we are beginning to realise that there is only one world and that it's fragile and that it belongs to us all and particularly to our children and grandchildren. The instinct to compete is strong in the human psyche and so is the instinct to cooperate. Now is the time for cooperation. Young people are often idealistic and that's why when they do interest themselves in matters of technology, it's the alternative techno technological ideas associated with development which the Chief Executive Philip. Uh, Bishop Butler, uh, Philip Greenish, Chief Executive of the Academy, you, you've sold it to me. Uh, you're a wonderful communicator. Uh, we often hear you on Thought for the Day. Uh, engineers traditionally, I think, are not brilliant communicators. In a way, you've given us the answer, but how can we turn ourselves into better communicators so that we can sell ourselves and sell this wonderful profession better than we do? It, it really is a, a significant problem. And I, and I think it's a particular problem in this country and, and not such a problem in, in other parts of the world, strangely. And it is partly a problem of language, as I've said. Engineer is used, the word engineer is used in so many different ways and in the public mind is associate, associated more uh, with, with the, the fitter than it is with the professional engineer. I mean, not only that, somebody was saying to me before, uh, uh, while, while we were gathering, uh, that uh, with, the, with the new wonderful St Pancras uh, as, as station uh, designed, you know, built by civil engineers, the, uh, the press were saying, well, we won't use the word civil engineer because people don't know what that means. We'll use the word architect. And so in a sense, there is, there is almost a, a vicious circle where the press don't use the word engineer for professional engineers because they think people don't understand it. Uh, and therefore people don't realize that it means professional engineering. Now, all I can, all I can do is, you know, when, <laughs> going from my overlapping world, uh, when, when anybody becoming, an, uh, be, becoming a bishop, uh, the first thing they have to do is, of course, in engaging with the media. You know, and, and we all do it, four or five days. Uh, and it's, it's money well spent uh, because you get Inside. Do you realize that the media are, are in the entertainment business and they, they, what they want you know, is, is an entertaining story? And if you, can, if you can present something quite serious in an entertaining way, then you've got a much better chance of, of it being carried. Uh, and you've got lots of stories to tell. That's, that's what I was trying to indicate. We really have got lots of stories to tell. The other thing is, I think we have to challenge. I mean, whenever I'm... Uh, 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 interviewed. You've been very good this evening, Mr. President. I mean, normally uh, it will start with, in these days of falling church congregations, Bishop, you know, what have you got to say on whatever it is? And I always stop and say, well, actually, in my diocese, the number of people in church have been going up year on year for the last 10 years. So let's just get that out of the way. And equally, I think you have to challenge uh, the word, you know, when, 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 when the word engineering is being used in an improper way. Or to take the opportunity when you, when you are in a position to, uh, to communicate, to say, well, first I want to say, you know, that engineering is very exciting and the life of a professional engineer is one of the best ways of, you know, I mean, be gung-ho about it. Uh, I know I'm not suggesting that, that everybody should be doing that, 
but I think one can be rather more forthcoming than engineers sometimes are. But basically, it is, it, it is the language. And I did think years ago, you know, the technology and technologists would, would kind of take over for that reason. But it hasn't happened. So, there's one in the back. Oh, on the aisle, please. Thank you. You've quite rightly raised the issue of climate change. Mm. But unless I'm missing something, the perception today is the scientists have shown the public what a mess the engineers have made yeah. of the climate. Now, have you got any advice on how we turn this around and become the solvers of the problem rather than the perpetuators of the problem? Well, that is a, that is a wonderful example. You mustn't, you mustn't allow that perception to be made. But you're quite right. And I think in the public mind, and certainly in the young part, engineering is associated with big business who've made an awful mess of things. And uh, the scientists may, may then help you. Again, before, before uh, the uh, our gathering, we were talking. And, and uh, as well as I was told about St Pancras, I was told also, of course, the breakdown at, at rugby with rail track was an engineering problem. In, in the, it, so so in, a, in a sense, out there, you know, the scientists think great things. The engineers mess it up. And you've got to tackle that. That is not so. And you, you, you've got to be forthcoming. As I say by, I mean, in, in a very amateurish way, I was kind of flagging up all sorts of, of kind of engineering projects, which, which, which quite obviously are for the good of humanity. And I think you could, you could you, I'm sure they, it's happening. They can be developed, they can be sold, they can be presented. If that laptop computer could be presented, as it is, I mean, the, the media got hold of that, and there was a television program on it last week. It caught the imagination. Lots of other things that can catch the imagination. So don't let the scientists run with it. It won't work if the scientists do it anyway. Uh, Bishop, I want to say uh, thank you very much. I, I, the, uh, the subjects you talked about are right front and center, both for the academy as a whole and the, the council of this academy. Uh, one of the things which we're very clear about is uh, that in order to make uh, engineering relevant uh, for today, it has to be something that grabs the imagination of something that can make a difference uh, in the minds of people in, in the country. Uh, I'm very struck by the fact that engineering, of course, is a, is a pursuit uh, that is a very broad one and incorporates uh, aspects of management, procurement, logistics, uh, the integration of activity uh, to solve, uh, to mitigate the impact of human activity on climate change uh, is an enormous task. It's an enormous task which is similar to the task which faced everyone after the Second World War. But that was not solved actually by scientists, nor was it solved by rhetoric, but it was solved by leadership and engineering. I think we have the same task here. Ladies and gentlemen, Bishop, thank you very much. Let's go downstairs and have dinner. <laughs>